to another edition of Thunderdome! Welcome to the Mad Max Minute. We are now boarding all sections. Please proceed to the gate in an orderly manner as we watch Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome one minute at a time. I'm Rick. And I'm Julia. And today we're talking about Minute 94. 94. Sweet as. Which begins with Max explaining how fortunate Jedediah is to be a pilot at this very moment. And it ends with Max and Savannah drastically reducing the weight of the aircraft. Coming in on any runway that's plenty long and mighty dry is our guest for this week, Jim O'Kane of the Airport Minute podcast. Right rudder, right rudder. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks guys for having me on. I really appreciate being here. Oh, thank you for joining us. You are, oh wow, probably one of the busiest guys in movie by minute podcasting that I can think of just because of how relentless you are with the different projects you take on. Self-inflicted, 100%. <laughs> <laughs> I'm enjoying it, though. It's really, it's really It's been a lot of fun, and I really enjoy the, uh, the, the Movies by Minute community. I think that's what really pushes, pushes me on. It's, it's fun seeing other people going through the same stuff and, uh, and being able to share notes and stuff and figure out what we're doing right and wrong. And uh, it's, you know, it just keeps getting bigger and bigger. We're almost, we're almost going to cross the century mark, I think, before uh, our August uh, meeting up in Denver. That's right. We were stalled out at about 94 different offerings on moviesbyminutes.com. By the way, moviesbyminutes.com slash Denver for information about the 2018 meetup. Actually, you know what? Strike that because this episode's going out in November. So oh, sorry you missed it. <laughs> it was great. Rick, we, just take all that out. so much fun. Yeah. They were throwing out candy to the audience every 10 minutes. It was wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll be having more next year. So keep staying tuned and, and just go to moviesbyminutes.com to uh, to find out uh, more. There's there's If you haven't found a movie that you like, in the movies by minute then make one of your own that's mm -hmm. the best way to do it that's how we all got started doing it for sure <laughs> speaking of different shows on offer you have picked and chosen a lot of <laughs> air and space themed podcasts you started off with the airport minute you did the rocketeer you're doing apollo 13 they all have that common theme of flying through the air so this seemed like the perfect week to bring you the consistent element through all of those different projects in to talk about this it would seem to be that but I, I i other i do not have a pilot's license but i just seem to spend a lot of my life around airplanes i worked for an aircraft company for about 20 years uh my mom worked for american airlines since uh 1943 retiring in 1989 so i've spent a lot of my time uh wandering through planes and uh being on planes and uh <laughs> And talking about them on uh, on the silly uh, silly idea of a podcast, so uh, <laughs> why not bring me in when we're when we're in the middle of uh, a great uh, takeoff scene? Exactly. Have you ever thought of getting your pilot's license? I have been getting uh, have been considering it. Uh, I had a choice of either going for a master's degree or getting my uh, pilot's license, and I went for the uh, master's degree in space science. So uh, <laughs> now I got to double back, and maybe I can get it before uh, before they close the lid on the coffin. So okay, I'll get a uh, I'll get up there one of these days. Uh, but it's it's such a a great a, a great feeling, and you know, watching this movie, you really get the the whole idea, the whole. I mean, air, airplane take takeoffs are such a dramatic situation. You know, it's like, are they going to get up in the air? Are they going to hoist yourself up? The Rocketeer, uh, which we talked about on, on previous podcast, it starts with an airplane taking off. And it just, it really enthralls an audience. And it, there's no uh, exemption here. I mean, it's just watching this whole thing. You just, as you're watching it, you slowly, you find yourself slowly leaning forward, like, come on, come on. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Before we get to the plane, though, we do have this little bit of a interaction, a continued interaction between Max and Jedediah. Max said last Friday, you have a plane and Jedediah played dumb. And then we heard the plane starting up outside, which just puts Jedediah in such an awkward situation. And Max leans in a bit closer and he says, it just might save your life. And of course, Jedediah says it will and max is like oh yeah it will now is it going to save his life from max or from auntie and her gang all of the above i would think yeah yeah <laughs> if max doesn't 
kill him, Auntie will. Certainly. Although, there's no guarantee that Auntie would hurt Jedediah. He's yeah. a fairly common face, I would assume, in Barter Town. And what motivation would she have? Yeah, he, he's, he's, a, he's a pilot who knows how to fly. As far as we know, there's no other pilots in, you know, within miles of Barter Town. Mm -hmm. So and, he would be an asset. And even if there were, they would probably also look like Bruce Spence. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yes, the, the most outrageous uh, headgear he wears is a pith helmet. So, uh. <laughs> so, I mean, all pilots in Australia look like Bruce Spence? I would say find me evidence to the alternative, but we already know that there's at least one photograph in this movie of a pilot who does not look like Bruce Spence. <laughs> yeah, he has a completely different hat. <laughs> uh, but I, I don't know if Bruce has ever been uh, viewed on a Viewmaster before, though. That's Yeah. <laughs> other side of it yeah i don't know about that <laughs> maybe you've talked about this in a previous minute but i'm fascinated by the um is it cocapelli the, the the style of uh, primitive uh, artwork that's on the ceiling of his uh of his little abode there um it's a combination of graffiti and uh, peace signs and suns and just i i would love to spend time on the set and just read all the things in the background <laughs> yeah funny I... you should mention that <laughs> because you can Oh, really? Yep. When we were first introduced to this set last week, I'll go over this quickly for the sure. the people that were already listening. But if you go to Cooper PD in Australia, you can visit Crocodile Harry's Underground Nest and Dugout. It costs $5 for adults, $2 for kids. It's open 9 a.m. to noon. They take a break for two hours in the afternoon, and then they're open again from 2 p.m. to 6 p.m. And you can just walk around. I don't know if they have any guided tours or anything like that, but you can go to this place. And you can just spend hours looking at all the little minutia. Okay, I'll be on uh, Travelocity shortly after we finish recording and see if I can get a ticket to get get out there because <laughs> this just looks fascinating. I I just love I love watching Bruce Spence's face. He just he has that Malcolm McDowell quality, but as a in, in a comedy, he just has this comedic look, the the bugged out eyes and the long face. And just answering the, you know, I do, I am. <laughs> it's, it, it's, it's that, and it's that comedy rule of threes with the, you know, the three questions and the three responses. It boggles my mind how, is calm the right word? But how not bothered he is that his house has been invaded by this group of people. But he's been a survivor that way. I mean, he, he's, he just mostly, you know, he's in a topsy-turvy uh, apocalyptic universe and I think you either panic or you just try to assess what's going on. And he seems to be more of an assessor than a panicker. Yeah, it must be a cultural difference between the United States here and post-apocalyptic Australia, where any post-apocalyptic movie in America, people are very standoffish. They greet you at the end of a gun and all of this other stuff. But here, Jedediah isn't even getting up from the bed. He's still sitting there with his magazine and goofy magnifying glasses. In the tradition of movie Australian pilots, the only other one I can think of is Jacques from uh, uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark at the beginning there. He's just telling, uh, <laughs> I want to say Han Solo, he's telling <laughs> Indiana Jones to calm down. And, uh, you know, that's just his pet snake Reggie and all that. He's just Eh, whatever you know it, and this seems to be he seems to be taking the oh really okay hmm and he just doesn't seem to be very uh, uh proactive it's more reactive and the other the other thing is that he he's half of a relationship here and we're probably going to get into this more <laughs> it's it for further and further episodes but one of the things that keeps striking me at this besides doing my podcast is i have a i run a, a website that i've been running since 1995 called tv dads and what I talk about on TV Dads is the history of single dads on television. And it's become a genre that nobody seems to recognize except me. But the idea of having a single dad in a storyline, it infiltrates all the other genres like Westerns and uh, science fiction movies, or in this case, a post-apocalyptic uh, thriller. And there, the idea of having a single dad, uh, it's kind of a shorthand that can tell the audience, you know what this guy is going to be like. And single dads as a, as a case study are generally calm hmm. especially on tv but also in the in the movies because they have to be calm for the sake of their children and bruce and his son here he keeps him calm by being uh, you know it's like a fa like father like son right down to wearing the same pith helmets with the little fan on the front but they they're a team because there is no mom so 
he has to be the entire family for his uh, for his child. And you know, this if you look if you step back on this movie, it's kind of you can make the case that this is actually Jedediah's story and Mad Max is a guest star on the Jedediah show because <laughs> I mean he's he's at the beginning we set the scene with him at the beginning and we follow Jedediah past the end. I mean, he you know Max leaves the leaves the narrative. Um, short, I don't want to spoil anything, but he's he's going to be leaving the narrative here uh, shortly. So it's really a story about what happened to Jedediah and his son, and you know the Lost Boys and Wendy there. Um, it, w- but it's told in the context of a single dad story. Um, I know it's a bit <laughs> it's a bit of a twist, but having run the the website for many years and hearing other people's uh, hypotheses about single dads in the movies and on TV, it's amazing how prevalent uh, single dads are in movies um and as i I apologize because you're going to be waking up in the middle of the night going wait a minute all the disney movies that's a single you know uh, the little mermaid and beauty and the beast they're they're all single single dads in these things (laughs) um pinocchio it it goes back to pinocchio and you know he's actually building his son much like you know uh, dr frankenstein built his creature so it's like this constant urge of a man without you know it's it's a dad without a mom with a child and uh you know here that's playing out again uh right here so it's uh you know, you're gonna you're gonna spot these in other movies and go. I didn't I never realized this is how this is how it is. But <laughs> it is, this would be you know this would be 1985's example of a single dad in the movies. And I think it's a very good example. Yeah. The the calmness that we've been talking about is exactly how Jedediah is practiced to react to things. His son, he's a spitfire. He is excitable. He is exuberant somebody has to ground the pair. Yeah. And of course it's going to be the adult. So I'm sure that they have had scares and close calls before. So Jedediah knows how to handle stuff like this. Yeah. Yeah. And and think about, you know, just overlay the characters of Andy and Opie Taylor from the Andy Griffith show. It's pretty much the same (laughs) personalities involved. It's, uh, you know, the youngsters bringing stuff home and dad has to react to it and try to try to keep the house together. Of course, Andy didn't have a pilot's license, but who knows if Jedediah really has a pilot's license. Yeah, I think they're all more or less self-taught but you raise the interesting visual in my head of little opie anthony down by the railroad track shoveling dirt onto the track so he can take one of his dad's guns and hold up the train (laughs) i'd watch that show (laughs) (laughs) but yeah but we we, you know it 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 infiltrates all parts of our lives i mean think of um star trek deep space nine you know that's a that's a single dad who happens to run a space station. And it's it's all of this stuff. I mean, in a way, Max becomes a dad to the uh, to the Lost Boys here. Um, although Savannah Nix is kind of the, the mom, but she's also more like a Wendy. She's the, 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 mm. the most adult-like child. So then you can start getting into single parenthood situations like a uh, party of five or other. Well, we'll, we'll that'll, that'll tear, <laughs> take us all in a different direction. <laughs> but yeah, it, it's mostly somebody has to be the adult. And in this case, Case, Max is being the adult to those kids, and so he's kind of taken guardianship of them to get them where they need to be, even if it means sacrificing himself to uh, to rescue these kids that are now his um, dependents. Yeah. Well, it's not the first time he's done it. Yeah. In Road Warrior, there's the entire subplot where he is interacting with the feral child, and the feral child is more or less imprinting on him as an example of or a guardian to the point where he tries to sneak into the interceptor before Max leaves. And Max has to basically do the end of Harry and the Hendersons and try and shoo him away. Yeah. Be mean just for, but for a good purpose. Mm. Uh, it's And in that instance, it was very good that the feral child did not go with Max because there was enough tragedy in that crash. Yeah. That wouldn't work. We out did not well. need the feral child added to it. <laughs> <laughs> On another topic here, I'm always impressed in all the Mad Max movies, and especially ones with a big budget where they could afford time to <laughs> to put it together. The lighting on uh, Mel Gibson's face in the cave, actually on all of them, it's such it's such a great close feeling that you're you know he is the center of uh, of your attention. The editor for uh, Citizen Kane, Greg Toland, said that people respond first to light, second to motion, third to position on the screen, and namely the upper right-hand portion of the screen is the most important uh, to 
audiences in, in terms in the in that they've been trained to look to the upper right of a screen to watch for action and uh Mel seems to slide in a bit at the at the beginning of that minute and uh where he's he's telling him that you're gonna you know you're gonna save your life and things and you just get that key light right across his eyes Mm -hmm. that you know he's your entire the entirety of your attention is focused on what he's saying that he's you know kind of omniscient as to what's going to happen next but just beautiful cinematography it really is and it really translates for us Max is being quite menacing in this moment. So he indicates that having this airplane is going to save Jedediah's life. And as he's doing that, yeah, he kind of steps towards Jedediah with this look in his eyes. And like you said, Jim, that it's lit, his eyes are lit in just such a way, and he's walking towards the camera in just such a way. It's very deliberate and very threatening. Yeah. And, and and the same thing, the reverse shot where we're looking at Jedediah, his eyes are also lit. You know, they have that key light right across his nose. And mm-hmm. he's, you know, he's taking in what Max is telling him. You know, he's like absorbing it all. So you just, and there's nothing else is important in the in the frame. It's just those two guys talking to each other and, uh, and Jedediah is soaking it in as to what he has to do next. <laughs> yeah. I really want one of those pith helmets. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Currently in Texas, it's 103 degrees, and we're expecting 107. Oh, <laughs> and I just think it'd be nice to have a fan on my forehead all the time, which just all the time stepping yeah. outside. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we just finished a heat wave, and it wasn't that bad. It was you know mid 90s. Yeah, but for us, it was pretty bad. Oh yeah, yeah, I know it's it's rough. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, just to remind our listeners, we're recording this in July. Yes. That's so. right. It's middle think, of winter. Think back, <laughs> yeah, think back to the good old days when complaining about sweating too much and the windows were open or you had to, you know, it, the sun was so bright. Mm. <laughs> Remember that so for our American listeners, forget the fact that Thanksgiving is quickly approaching. Stop worrying about pecan pies and all that other stuff. Join us back here in July <laughs> yes. for a moment. But if you're if, <laughs> if you're an Australian uh, fan of Australian movies, you're probably listening to this in the in the middle of summer. So enjoy. <laughs> Everything about this movie, it, 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 when you, one of the things that, that makes a great movie to me is if you can stop on any frame, which we, <laughs> as movie by minuteers do, oh, yes. you can stop in any frame and every frame looks like a painting. It looks like, it looks like a very carefully uh, painted uh, storyboard. So you can see, and it probably was storyboard, uh, definitely. I mean, it's just being able to save on all these different setups. There's so many shots that the camera hardly ever moves. So you're getting these beautiful, just static shots and seeing what's in the frame. So it makes kind of the audience work for what's happening on the screen. Mm -hmm. And if you spend your time looking around and searching for things, the audience feels more invested. I think when, when the cameras are doing smash zooms and pointing at stuff, you're really, I think you lose interest. I know a lot of people enjoy the, the transformer movies, but one of the things that bothers me on the transformer movies is that the action is evenly placed across the frame. So you'll see, you know, two robots fighting and then somebody running in the bottom. You're not exactly sure where to look and it kind of disobeys the, the language that we've all grown up with, we've all been trained on in watching a, a movie. This And this movie has such classic cinematography, such classic directing your eye toward the next thing. Everything happens in the middle, the middle third of the, the screen um, and uh, the action forces you toward the center a lot. You'll see a lot of, uh, in this and in the, in the coming minutes, especially during the takeoff, all the action is happening toward the vanishing point at the middle of the screen. And even during the dialogue here where Max and Jedediah are going back and forth the angle that Jedediah is looking, if you superimpose the shots of Jedediah and Max on top of each other, they're facing each other yeah. in the frame. Mm, yeah. But yes. they're still very much centered in a circle that you could draw in a section just off of the center of the shot. So if you're following Jedediah's eyeline, when they cut from Jedediah to Max... There are Max's eyes. You don't have to go searching for them. Boom, they're there. Mm -hmm. It's like when you're reading a paragraph on a page. Your eye knows where it's supposed to go when it reaches the end of the line to hit the beginning of the next line. And we just do it naturally. Go from line to line to line. Our eyes know where they're supposed to go. Mm -hmm. So bits like this are set up perfectly that it just makes sense to us. True. And all, all of these all of these scenes, it, like the most important thing is happening where we're looking. So when the plane passes by, we're watching the kids following behind trying to get on the plane. So then, you know, the plane isn't the important thing. It's where are the kids now? What are they doing? How are they, you know, 
how are they responding? And what's nice about this section here is that even if you're following along with where your eye is supposed to be, if you stray from that, there's still plenty interesting things to see. The expression, for instance, of Pig Killer as he's standing, leaning on Tubba behind Max and looking at Jedediah. He's there with that crazy-eyed grin of his, despite the fact that he's probably bleeding to death out of his leg. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, or, you know, and the thing is, is that uh, even though this is the Hollywood movie of the Mad Max movies, I mean, this is the, are the mm. first of the Hollywood level of movies, George Miller still spends money like he's <laughs> like he's making the first movie. I, there's so many little tricks that he that he uses in uh, camera setups and things that so that he doesn't have to spend a lot of money or or, you know, build elaborate rigs. I love the part where uh, Jedediah is climbing into uh, the cockpit with his son in the way and, you know, the camera's shaking and he's shaking and it, it gives you that whole feeling of motion. But if you if you stop and watch it several times, you realize that he's just climbing into a, a cockpit of a plane that there's two stagehands bouncing it up and down against the static background. <laughs> And if you turn the sound off, it's just, oh, yeah, it's just he's bouncing that little plane. But it, it looks real. And when you know, when it's happening in this um, montage of quick cut scenes, you believe that, oh, yeah, they're they're running right alongside the plane as he's trying to get in. Um, just beautiful, beautiful classic movie making. Mm -hmm. So we go rather suddenly from Max interacting with Jedediah to them running out of the hole or hovel or whatever you want to call this hobbit hole of a settled area burrow maybe uh, <laughs> and they are sprinting towards this air truck that we saw back in the beginning of this movie and jedediah jr is there in the cockpit he's got this thing started up and it's already started rolling away and so everyone has to mount up on the run so to speak yeah it gives you an idea of how strong those uh <laughs> Those wings are that they're all climbing on board mm -hmm. uh, on top of the cargo that's already there. Mostly, I, I haven't seen uh, this pl this plane in America. The more one I'm more familiar with is the uh, the Ag Cat, um, and it used to be it used to be a crop dusting plane, but uh, the the ones that I see nowadays are mostly uh, hauling banners. You know, if you go to a <laughs> if you go to a, a a uh, you know a stadium and you're flying a Geico sign around the around the stadium. It's probably being pulled by an ag cat because they are such sturdy little uh, you know they're they're an engine with wings and that's that's about it. Um, the actually I had I've ha I had an ag cat crash behind my house uh, a few months ago. There was a fellow pulling a, a Geico uh, it actually it was a Geico banner and uh, he had to put down on the median of an interstate that runs near my house uh, because Whoa. he had an engine failure. And uh, quite, yeah, quite. Oh my goodness! Quite dramatic. Uh, large pictures of a of a gecko saying, you know, save fifteen percent, <laughs> kind of spread <laughs> spread across the highway. <laughs> oh. uh, but you know, if you want to get your get your face in the papers, it was a <laughs> great free advertising. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. As the kids are running out to the plane in this courtyard area, there's stuff everywhere. Mm-hmm. Something stood out to me, and I'm sure it stood out to the two of you as well, because it's pretty obvious. There is some sort of statue of a man on a horse. It's tragic that it's not an elephant. That way we could have said, can we address the elephant in the room? Yes. <laughs> or a, but it is or a, a horse. a 600-pound gorilla would be just fine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It reminded me of the carnival head that was put on Max. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Like this horse and rider might be a fiberglass, paper mache type decoration. Oh, certainly. Yeah. Now, do, yeah. You, do you think it's pre-apocalypse or post-apocalypse? Oh, I'll tell you one thing. I don't think it was added specifically by the production. I'm pretty sure that was there, and I'm pretty sure it's still there. Oh, okay. Nice. <laughs> What exactly is the horse doing? Is it bucking? I'm thinking it looks kind of like the uh, Wyoming state logo on their on their licenses. Yeah. I think the way it's supposed to be mounted is it should be pitched forward in such that the rear legs are off the ground. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. I see that now. And they, they stacked it on some kind of crate or something so that it was yeah. upright. Did you think the horse was... Well, I just thought the horse looked weird. Okay. Okay. <laughs> 
<laughs> like, but there's that iconic picture of a rider on a horse that is bucking. And I'm sure that's probably the, you said it was the Wyoming state logo. Yeah. I'm sure that's probably the image that I'm thinking of. Yeah. It's a typical, you know, rodeo imagery. Yeah. Um, and have we seen full size horses? I thought that the, when he went out on the oversized, uh, on the, with, with the oversized head, was that a donkey or was it a horse? That was a horse. It, it was, was a, horse. a horse. Okay. And I, there were horses seen earlier in the movie when we were walking into Barter Town. Okay. Yeah, I just I was wondering what the what the layer of animals were in <laughs> in in this you know, post apocalyptic uh, Australia. I, I do re- I did remember that there was a four legged creature, beast of burden that was that he was riding out on, but I couldn't couldn't remember whether it was a, a donkey or a horse. But a ho- okay, so it's good to know that uh, horses can survive uh, Armageddon. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah. So as Jedediah mounts up onto the wing, as you mentioned, he opens the door and tells Jedediah Jr. to move over. And Jedediah Jr. proudly pronounces that they are ready for liftoff. This kid. Oh my gosh. He was seemingly ready to abandon his father last week. And now he's behaving as if he always knew that his dad was going to catch up. I think he always knew his dad was going to catch up. Yeah, I guess. And But he's he hasn't um, relinquished control. I mean, he's in the left seat, right? So he, he's the pilot. He's I still... don't think there's a right or a left seat. I think there's just, just, a, just a the Just the one, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just wondering if he's if he's left of it if you know if he's on the left side generally even though even if there's only one set of controls the guy on the left is the one that's controlling it mm-hmm. but uh, maybe you know the the other thing of this is uh, there's sometimes we try to find symbolism that doesn't exist <laughs> <laughs> but why not I'm just wondering how much like Jedediah is supposed to be the adult in charge but often his son seems to be you know calling the shot and um i don't know if junior is kind of letting him think that he's in charge <laughs> they have an interesting dynamic because it's not so much the father son it's a lot more of that partnership yeah the whole idea of as soon as i'm off the plane fly straight home you bet your dad type of thing yeah where jedediah can go off for a day or two at a time to barter town to sell all these goods and he'll know that he'll be able to go back and find jedediah jr back at the hovel or at the burrow so yeah it's a co-worker or yeah like you said partner in a business mm-hmm. they're a small business out in the middle of nowhere and jedediah jr definitely has a ha, streak about him in that he's hanging out by the railroad tracks with guns that are taller than he is, <laughs> ready to stop yeah. and rob a train. Yeah, that's really quite something. <laughs> that, that entrepreneurial spirit. Oh, right. certainly. <laughs> so we see everybody running to get on the plane. I'll say Pig Killer is doing a really good job at keeping up. I'm not quite sure where Master is. I'm pretty sure he's on someone's back. Earlier, he was on Max's back. Mm -hmm. And then when Max ran into the room, wasn't on Max's back. And then we're just going to see him inside the aircraft. Yeah. Yeah. He could have been in one of those... uh, Isn't Max carrying luggage? Or is somebody's somebody's carrying some bag or something? I can't tell who is that. Pig killer. Somebody's carrying baggage just after uh, 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 Jedediah gets on the plane. Right around second fourteen, Max is once again carrying Master on his back. Ah, okay. Okay. There we go. I was distracted by the giant white horse. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, there we. Okay, I see him. Yes. Oh. But once everybody is on the plane, Savannah gets in, Max gets in, and he says, let him go. Let it go. It's time to get out of here. <laughs> and we begin this nice long sequence of Jedediah and Jedediah Jr. trying to get this thing off the ground. Yes, while well, a game of chicken is about to ensue. <laughs> <laughs> so Max somehow moves past the eight other people in the back of this one-seat agricultural plane, and he gets up to the front and asks what the problem is. And of course, Jedediah says they're not going to get off the ground. They're overloaded. These Transavia PL-12s, they only have a cargo capacity of about 4,000 pounds, I want to say. Let me check my thing. Yep. They have a max takeoff weight of 4,000 pounds or 1,855 kilograms. So whatever's weighing them down, probably the pile of junk that's held on those lower wings. So Max and Savannah take steps to get rid of that stuff. I was wondering if he had to check that out by using the uh, stignomometer that was hanging from the ceiling. It's kind of odd having a blood pressure uh, (laughs) cuff and and meter (laughs) hanging off the ceiling just, just in case. Yeah. (laughs) how tense are you and um, poor max bangs his head on the on the meter when he he gets up there i was impressed by 
Max's uh, no-nonsense approach to getting rid of the extra weight. Oh, yeah. I know that he had no choice. If there's extra weight on a plane, of course, you get rid of the cargo first. But he did not blink. He had this just immediate sort of sense of urgency attitude about it. Mm -hmm. And it was pretty great. I think other movies may have made more of a deal about, well, how do we get rid of this weight? We weigh too much sort of moment in the movie and George Miller skipped over that. Nope, Max is just, he knows what's going to be done and he does it. All of those goods. Who knows what they could have been worth? Legitimately, there may have been food and water in those supplies. Mm -hmm. In fact, that's probably exactly what was in there as a sort of bug out bag for Jedediah and Junior. Oh, okay, yeah. So that was probably some pretty important stuff that they dumped. Yeah, we never get to see Jedediah comment on all the things that are left behind, but I'm sure there were a few things that he would have preferred not to get rid of. Yeah. <laughs> How unfortunate for him. When we see him again, he's just lounging in bed reading a magazine. His work is done for the day. So if that's the case, then there wouldn't still be cargo to be unloaded sitting on the plane. And Jedediah Jr. was out playing in the backyard so More or less. if there was work to be done, they would have done it and then gone and played and relaxed. <laughs> so the cargo that was on the plane. It's like their permanent bug out bag then. Yeah, belonged yeah. on the plane. Probably more fuel. Perhaps. Hmm, perhaps. You seem skeptical of that. Well, the fuel tanks in the plane are in the wings. So if you have extra fuel, you'd probably have it just in the tanks. Because they're big tanks, right? I would think, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's why it's extra fuel, because it's more fuel than can fit in the tanks. I guess. It's like having, you know, a can of fuel that stays in the garage just in case. I should be more open to that because the fuel capacity of the air truck is only 181 liters or 48 gallons US. So that doesn't sound like a lot to me, not for a plane. Yeah. Oh, well. Does Jedediah buy his gas from Auntie Entity? That's the only thing I can think of him doing, because where else are you going to get fuel? So he does have a relationship with her. He probably has a better relationship with the person who's actively selling fuel in Barter Town. He probably oh. hasn't come in contact with the boss lady. Well, Dr. Dealgood was in possession of the camels, so he probably traded the camels to Dr. Dealgood in exchange for among other things, fuel. Yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah, I was just I was just wondering, <laughs> though, as he is a rare commodity, um, we he's the only active flyer that we've seen that he might be bigger in society simply because he has the tech and he also has the equipment that Anti might think, you know, more of being involved with him might, might consider him a person of, uh, you know, wealth and property in, in this society. Although I, a useful contact to have. Yeah. I definitely see a lot of potential there, perhaps too much potential. Mm -hmm. Maybe he doesn't want that sort of lifestyle. That There's a sort reason of he's not living in Barter Town. Exactly. And Auntie seems like the type who, rather than having a healthy trading relationship with somebody of his particular skill set might take that relationship to an extreme and he would be forced into servitude. Yeah, I don't like the sound of that. Yeah, <laughs> not so good. I think he likes the free lifestyle that he lives. Yeah, so probably a good idea for Jedediah to stay as far away from Auntie as possible. Yeah, which that identity might be hard to keep secret. When we saw him in Barter Town after he had traded all the goods he stole from Max, I believe he had a propeller. It's I'm hard pretty to sure say. We talked it's been about a while. It. I'm pretty sure he had airplane parts. So it might be hard to keep that a secret. And why does he buy so much fuel? I don't know. Hmm. One of the many mysteries of the wasteland, I guess. Well, we're getting on in time. Jim? Yes? Is there anywhere you would like people to go to find more of the things that you make? Well, sure. If you're uh, if you're looking for us, always go to uh, moviesbyminutes.com. If you don't find one of mine, I do airport uh, airport minute, Rocketeer minute, uh, Apollo thirteen minute, and I produced uh, Die Hard minute. So if you don't like any of those movies, there's <laughs> there's dozens of other ones. Mm -hmm. uh, but go to moviesbyminutes.com. We'll say this time, uh, uh, head to head to moviesbyminutes.com and try some of the other ones because. It's uh, it's very interesting how varied uh, the approaches on different movies are. So uh, check it out. You can find one to your taste. Or uh, you know, if you don't find one, again, as we always say, make your own. Absolutely. And as for us, we are going to take a break. But we will be back on Wednesday. We're going to catch up with Auntie and her fleet. Although it might be more 
appropriate to say that she catches up with us, but they're going to scream through Jedediah's front yard like a bunch of yahoos in their souped up cars, making a racket and such. I need to get off my lawn. Yeah, rotten kids. Also, and rather unfortunately, Jedediah is going to run out of runway, and out of nowhere, Screwloose is going to come up. So there's that. We'll see you on Wednesday. The Mad Max Minute Podcast is a fan project by Rick and Julia Ingham. The Mad Max franchise was created by George Miller and Byron Kennedy, is presented by Kennedy Miller Mitchell Productions, and distributed by Warner Brothers. Mad Max Minute is produced and edited by Rick Ingham. Our opening music is Verdi's Dies Ire by Daniel Batista of DanielBatista.com. And our outro music is We Don't Need Another Hero by MilitiaVox of MilitiaVox.com. Our home on the internet is MadMaxMinute.com. You can follow us on Twitter at MadMaxMinute, like us on Facebook by searching for Mad Max Minute, and join our Facebook listener group, Mad Max Minute Beyond Microphone. If you'd like to support the podcast, visit MadMaxMinute.com where you can check out our Tee Public storefront by clicking the store link join our patreon by clicking the support link or make a one-time donation by clicking the donate link thank you for joining us for minute 94 of beyond thunderdome we'll see you next time Everybody say-